But I wanna speak to you tonight from a thought uh, that I have entitled, The Challenge of Prayer. Sometimes God says no. The Challenge of Prayer. Sometimes God says no. And I understand how that that may sound counterintuitive, being that this is a message in a prayer meeting where week after week we are encouraging you to believe God for the needs that you have in your life. But I just want to help you to see that sometimes when God doesn't answer our prayers, or at least doesn't answer our prayers in the way or in the time that we expect him to, that it's not as devastating as it sometimes may initially seem to be. That sometimes when God says no, because of what he knows is best, his no is the best answer that he can give us. The challenge of prayer, sometimes God says no. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he, Jesus, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For I've come to learn that when I am weak, then am I strong. Let's pray. Father, I thank you with all of my heart for the opportunity to share your word tonight. Father, I thank you for those who are both in the house and online tonight, God, who are in need of your direction and of your touch. Father, I thank you for the desire and the willingness that is in your heart to meet with us tonight and to minister to us. Father, I'm asking in the next few moments that you would help me to be able to communicate the thoughts, the truths that I believe you've put on my heart for such a time as this. God, that you would give every one of us in this house, and those who are and will watch later online, give every one of us the ability to see, to hear, and to receive everything that is in your heart for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. More than any other human figure in the Bible, I love the Apostle Paul. And it's not only because of his incredible insights concerning the new covenant and its many and varied implications for our lives, but it's also because of Paul's transparency concerning his personal struggles and difficulties in walking with Christ. Whenever you read the Apostle Paul, he's real and he's raw. Paul's humanity makes up for a large part of his ministry. Although he's the primary leader of the first century church, he's not afraid to identify with people in the deepest and most despairing of struggles. It's like Paul's life, not just his theology, is like an open book. And the pages over and over and over again testify to us that True Christianity is not just a life that is absent of problems or perplexities. Quite the opposite, it's often a life that's filled with them. And in no place is this truth more evident than in 2 Corinthians, which I kind of like to identify as Paul's life testimony or as Paul's life book. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul talks about a season of his life where he was burdened to the point of despair. 
In chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, he talks about another season in his life where he and his ministry partners were afflicted in every way. As they looked to the left, there was hardship. As they looked to the right, there was difficulty. As they looked behind them, there was oppression. And as they looked forward, there was more difficulty. We get to chapter seven and he talks about another season of his life. And the only way that he knows to describe it is that there were fightings without and fears within. And then we get to chapter 11 where there's this infamous long list of trials and challenges that he had to endure for the sake of the testimony of Christ. When he talks about having being shipwrecked and beaten with rods and falsely accused and all of the things that transpired in and through his life. You see, one of the things that encourages me about the Apostle Paul and his transparency is that his life testifies to me that true victory for the believer in Jesus Christ is not the absence of difficulty. Rather, it's the presence of of God. True victory is not living our lives absent of challenge or contest. True victory is living amidst challenge and contest while continuing to believe that God is with me, that God is for me, and that God is actively at work in and through my life. It's amazing to me that although 2 Corinthians is filled with these stories of intense trial and struggles that Paul had to endure, still his testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 2 and verse 14 is that Jesus always causes us to triumph in every place. In other words, that no matter where we are and no matter what trouble we find ourselves in, the testimony of God over our lives, the declaration of God over our lives is that of victory. You see, Paul understood that trials didn't remove him from the sphere of God's blessing, nor did they they negate the purposes of God for his life. Actually, trials, hard seasons, often seem to serve as avenues through which God was greater glorified in and through his life than ever before. But you see, this isn't something that even Paul, being the de facto spiritual leader of the first century church, knew instinctively. This is something that I believe Paul had to learn experientially. It's something that he learns progressively through the things that God allows him to endure, which brings us to his testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is speaking in hindsight. He's looking back at one of the most trying and challenging seasons of his life. And though it's not clear exactly what Paul is going through in this moment, what is clear because of his testimony in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 7 through 10 is that it's painful. And we know that what he's going through is painful because Paul does two things. Number one, he describes it as a thorn, something sharp, something pointed, something pain-inducing. But then secondly, not only does he describe it as a thorn, but he pleads with God three different times for God to remove it from his life. However, as Paul prays for the deliverance from this sharp, pointed, pain-inducing thing in his life, Paul doesn't receive the answer to his prayer that he's expecting. Instead of, yes, Paul, I'll remove the thorn, God responds to Paul's prayer with, no, but I'll give you grace. You know, beloved, I'm coming to learn and believe that one of the greatest tests of our faith is how we respond to God when he says no 
or not yet. When his answers to our prayers are not the answers that we had hoped or expected them to be. What do you do when you are in fact in need, hurting, in pain, afflicted, and you pray for deliverance, but God says no? What do you do when it feels like God is saying maybe, but definitely not yet? And not only does Paul receive no as the answer to his prayer, but eventually, and maybe even to make it worse in the moment, eventually Paul becomes aware that this thorn is actually being used by God himself to accomplish a divine and specific purpose in his life. You mean to tell me that God was not only okay with Paul's suffering, but that he was actually utilizing it for some divine purpose? That's exactly what I'm saying to you. For a reason beyond Paul's immediate understanding, God allowed this pointed, this sharp, this difficult thing in his life. God allowed some difficulty that Paul did not immediately value or appreciate to come into his life and to bring about this weakening. And it's not just that Paul lacked understanding, but also that his troubles were being misunderstood by those that he loved most. As you read his letters, some were interpreting his weaknesses and his trials as a sign of God's disfavor over his life. You read the remainder of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and even the Corinthians were saying, you know, Paul's a good theologian, but all of these trials and struggles that he's having to endure, I think this is a sign that God has abandoned him and that God is no longer at work in and through his life. But you see, here's what Paul was beginning to learn. That the very things that he and they thought disqualified him were the very things making Paul fit for divine use. His weaknesses, as painful as they were in the moment, were actually making room for God's power to be put on display in greater measures than he had ever known or seen before. You see, beloved, God sees things differently than we do. And sometimes he is more glorified with the presence of thorns in our, in our lives than he is the absence of them. Because although painful, thorns, trying, difficult seasons have an ability to do for us what comfortable seasons cannot. And the challenge of prayer, the challenge of maintaining a consistent, vibrant prayer life between you and Jesus is trusting that if and when God says no, he knows best. This is one of the greatest challenges that we will face in establishing a consistent and vibrant prayer life with the Lord, is that in our times of prayer, if and when God says no, still believing, still trusting, still knowing deep within our hearts that he knows what's best. Beloved, can I encourage you tonight that God's knows or not yet are not always the end of our stories. Often God's knows and not yet are the beginning of God beginning to do something significant and divine in and through our lives by his power. In the moment, Paul didn't understand that. In the moment, Paul probably didn't appreciate that truth. But hindsight is 2020. Looking back to what he went through, Paul understands that God's no, God's not yet in that moment was the greatest answer that God could have given him. 
God's no, God's not yet was not the end of Paul's story. It was just the beginning of God beginning to do something very significant and powerful through his life by the Holy Spirit. And so what can no, not yet answers do better than yes, right now answers? What can no, not yet answers do better sometimes than yes, right now answers? Number one, they work to increase our dependence on Jesus. No, not yet, work to increase or deepen our dependence on Jesus. Number two, no, not yet answers work to put God's power on display to the world around us. Number two, they work to put God's power on display to the world around us. And thirdly, sometimes God's no, not yet, shame our adversary in a way that his yes right now's cannot. They shame our adversary. Number one, they increase our dependence on Jesus. Look at what Paul says in verse seven of chapter 12. So that I wouldn't be exalted above measure. I was given a thorn in the flesh. Paul is saying, so that I wouldn't get to a place to where I felt as though I could be who God was calling me to be without his power and his presence in my life, I was given a thorn. Paul is saying my propensity, my natural tendency toward independence, toward relying upon my own strength and my own abilities necessitated the thorn in my life. Paul, looking back, understood that he had a natural tendency to trust in his own abilities and in his own strengths. And so that God would save him from ever trusting or continuing to trust in his own strengths and abilities, God gifted or gave him a thorn. The word given here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 And verse seven, when Paul says, God gave me a thorn, it means to give with goodwill or intention. It's like giving a gift to someone. Think of it. It was as if God was saying to Paul, Paul, I wanted to give you a gift in this season. And the greatest gift I could think to give you was a thorn plus my grace to be able to endure it. God understood, even though Paul couldn't in the immediate, that his no, his not yet, was going to equate to a deepening of Paul's trust and reliance in Jesus. Secondly, God's no's, his not yet's, God allowing thorns in our lives sometimes work to put God's power on display to the world around us in a way that his yes right now cannot. Not only was God deepening Paul's trust in Jesus, but unbeknownst to Paul, he was using Paul's deepening to deepen the trust of millions upon millions upon millions of believers after him. Looking back 2,000 years later, Paul's story still gives us strength and still gives us hope today. Paul, in the moment, afflicted by pain, could have never dreamed that people centuries later would be so encouraged by one of his deepest struggles. Yet here we are, And what God brought Paul through is now bringing us through 2,000 years later. Beloved, can I say to you, you have no idea 
how that God can take what you're going through right now and use it as a testimony to someone in your future that you don't even know or see yet. Sometimes your present struggle is the catalyst for which or by which you become effective in the kingdom in your future. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said we were burdened to the point of despair. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say that even though we were burdened to the point of despair, God came and he met with us in our struggle and he began to give us hope. And because God met with us in our struggle, now we are capable of meeting with others in their struggle and encouraging them with the same hope that we've received from God in our struggle. Beloved, you have no idea how God is going to use your story for his glory in your future, in the life of somebody that you can't even see yet. You see, the presence of the thorn is not indicative of the fact that God is absent or afar off. It may be indicative of the fact that God is actually nearer and more active in your life than he's ever been before. And I'm not saying that God is always the author of bad things. But what I am saying is that nothing, nothing as a child of God comes into our lives absent of his providential guidance and care his ability to keep it from coming. And here's the beautiful thing, speaking to the third point. What can God's knows and not yet's do better than his yes and right now's? Shame or adversary. Even if we are facing something, even if you are facing something tonight that is orchestrated by hell itself. God can take what hell means for your downfall and he can use it for your good and for his glory. I don't know how he does it, but all through my life, I've seen God take the weapons that Satan meant for my demise and for my destruction and use them as tools for my growth and for my sanctification. Over and over again, I have watched God shame the devil with the very things, with the very seasons that the devil thought was going to destroy me. I've seen it over and over and over again. And Paul actually says, that this thorn in some measure was influenced by Satan himself. That to some degree, Satan had a hand in this. And we know that Satan is only after one thing, and that is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God says, Paul, you just watch as I use the thing that Satan means for your downfall and destruction and use it for the furtherance of my glory in and through your life. The prophet Isaiah says it like this in Isaiah 54 and 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall be able to prosper. He never promised that the weapon would not be formed, but he did promise that the weapon would not be able to succeed in carrying out its desired will and intention over your life. Beloved, thorns, even those of evil intent and origin, cannot stop Christ's purposes from being accomplished in and through your life. The presence of God in your life and in my life, grace, because that's what grace is. It's the presence, the empowerment of God. The presence of God in your life and mine means that no matter what else is present in our life, it cannot crush us. Singers and musicians, if you guys don't mind coming back up. You know, something that's amazing to me is 
when Paul gets to the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he's writing from a prison cell his final thoughts and reflections on his journey with Jesus and his final commissioning of young people in the faith like Timothy, Paul understands that in just a few days, his head is going to be severed from his body. And as we know him on earth, we will know him no more. He understands that his journey's coming to an end and there's nothing that he can do about it. But what's amazing to me is that Paul's testimony in that prison cell in his final moments, it's not that of discouragement or defeat. Paul actually says in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Timothy, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, that despite everything that has happened in my life, despite people who have abused and maligned me, despite people who have persecuted me, and despite even my closest friends having abandoned me. This is his testimony, 2 Timothy 4, 17. The Lord has rescued me from the mouth of the lion. And in verse 18, and the Lord will continue to rescue me from every evil deed. Paul, what do you mean God's rescued you? You're in a prison cell. You're about to lose your life because of your faith in Jesus. How can you say that God has rescued you? Paul is not saying that God has rescued me from every hard, every difficult, every trying thing. What Paul is saying is, no matter what hell has tried to do, hell has been wholly unsuccessful in keeping me from walking in God's plan and God's purpose for my life. There have been times when God has allowed difficult things, but the difficult things have not been able to rob me of God's plan and God's purpose for my life. The Lord has, and the Lord will continue to rescue me from every evil intention and desire of my adversary. You see, beloved, God's no's to us are also his no's to our enemy. Satan, you can afflict Job, but you can't take his life. He's in my hand. And Satan, it's impossible, no matter what I allow you to do, to rob him of the divine plan and the purpose that I have for his life. Actually, Satan, I want to serve notice on you that when he comes out of this, when he comes out of being challenged and contested by you, he's going to come out better than what he went in. He's going to come out looking more like me than he did before. He's going to come out with more strength, more resolve, more courage, more tenacity, more faith. He's going to come out this out of this more convinced than ever before that I am who I am and I can do what I say that I can do. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. I take pleasure. I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For I'm coming to learn that when I am weak, then I am strong. Father, I thank you with all of my heart tonight for your presence. I thank you for the truths of your word. God, I know as we read stories like this, we may be tempted to say that you did not answer Paul's prayer. But God, I pray that we would see passages like this with full clarity. 
that we would see, God, yes, you did answer Paul's prayer. And that your no or your not yet answer was the best possible answer that you could have given Paul in that season because you knew what the no, the not yet would work in and through his life. And so for those tonight who are facing the no's or the not yet's of God, God, I pray that their hearts would be comforted tonight. God, I pray that they would be comforted by the reality that despite the no or the not yet, your plans and your purposes for their lives have not changed. God, that despite the no or the not yet, you are still with them. And if in fact you are with them, there is possibility for your glory to be known and to be seen in this season of their lives. God, that the end of the story is not going to be that of discouragement or defeat. The end of the story is going to be, God, you deepened my trust in you. God, you gave me a testimony for others. And God, through it all, you shamed my adversary. God, that's going to be the testimony of our lives. And so God, fill, fill the hearts of people tonight with faith in believing that your no and your not yet is not your rejection of them. It's just your rejection of their idea as to how your will might be accomplished in and through their lives. Father, thank you in Jesus' name.